Avocados are on the march. For some, they are a superfood and lifestyle product, but for others, a product with anything but green credentials. It's very good to eat. The oil's very good. Minerals, health, excellent. And avocado farming is now also booming in Europe, as seen with these gigantic plantations springing up in southern Portugal. All they can think it's about money, profit. I know that I can live without avocados, but I can't live without water. An avocado tree consumes as much water per day as a family of four, a super thirsty fruit in a country plagued by drought. I don't see a reason that we have to say that the avocado is uh, the Godzilla of the, of the water. Uh, it's not. Matthew Ambrose has fulfilled a lifelong dream on the Algarve. Nine years ago, he opened a guest house, or Kinta, together with his partner, Miro Paixao, here, not far from the Atlantic coast. They invested 650,000 euros in the property, which includes four guest rooms. Matthew and Miro regularly have returning guests, but fear this might all soon change. I was in the UK and I was working like crazy. I ran bars and restaurants and um, it all became too much and I needed to change my life. Um, I ended up in hospital, had a fairly major breakdown mentally and physically from stress and overwork and I had to change my life. So many years ago we discovered this area of Portugal while traveling and we sort of fell in love with it. As you can see, it's a fantastic property. We enjoy putting work into it. The daily upkeep is no trouble at all for us. It's a joy to work here seven days a week. So this is our little paradise of water that comes down from a natural spring up in the field up there and flows down here. And this is just a little paradise for birds, for insects. This little spring is of huge importance for Matthew and Miro. It supplies the water they need for the animals and for their oh, guest house. Great, isn't it? It's going to be devastating. The lack of a main water supply has not been a problem until recently. Now there's a serious danger looming on the horizon. The big threat is that because the avocado plantation were given licenses for boreholes, when there were supposed to be no more licenses being given, but they got three for three boreholes, and they've dug a borehole about 100 metres up here, straight up from this stream. And if that starts pumping um, for the amount of water they're going to use, I'm just really worried it's going to dry out the aquifer that obviously supplies this stream. That new danger is an avocado monoculture being developed practically in the backyard of Matthews Kinta. A company called Inspiring Farms is planting 26,000 trees for artificial irrigation on an area the size of 80 football pitches and counting. This used to be grazing land for cattle. Well, we have made a couple of attempts to sort of ask the manager to come and say hello and, you know, create a little bit of communication so we get some assurance of things that are happening. But they don't seem to have any... They're not interested, are they? The camera crew's presence hasn't gone unnoticed by the plantation owner. It's a question of neighbourly manners. Precisely. If there's a problem, just tell my secretary that you want to talk to me and just come by. I'm always here. So what's the problem? I don't want to see you cause any trouble, you got that? No consideration to, you know, anyone else around. No. 
The Algarve is a traditional vacation region, including coastal resorts like Faro and Lagos. And it's now also a highly attractive location for avocado farmers. Avocados originally hail from Mexico. Until recently, the European market was mainly supplied from Israel and Central and South America. But now the fruit is being increasingly farmed closer to home, thriving as it does in the warm climate of Southern Europe. Avocados yield four times the profit margin of the oranges and lemons traditionally grown in the region. But the monoculture farming has come under criticism worldwide due to the negative impact on the environment and, in particular, the fruit's high water consumption. In springtime, southern Portugal bursts into colour, but the country has been struggling for years with water shortages. Soon the intense summer heat will scorch the vegetation. Every year the region faces the threat of wildfires. In 2020, they raised 65,000 hectares of land, claiming the lives of several dozen people and destroying hundreds of houses. Hello. 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 Regenerate is a local association founded by people living next to two avocado plantations outside Lagos. Its members want to prevent the creation of further large-scale farms. The group is headed by two women from Germany. Annette Klaassen is an architect who immigrated 21 years ago. Eileen Grushka has been here for four years now and runs a small farm. It's actually agriculture that connects us. We all have little farm operations and are aware of the water problems here. Some of the wells are drying up and the boreholes too. Avocado trees need 50 or 60 litres of water a day. So projecting that for the two plantations here, that's three and a half million litres of water every single day. Claudia Seal works for the Marine and Environmental Research Department of the University of Algarve. The association has invited the bioengineer to share her findings about the situation in the region. Together, they want to recruit new data to further the fight against the avocado growers. Yes, mainly the water issues. Uh, we have now... Oh, re remember that we can see the level here. It's getting lower and lower and lower every year. The average is about 80 percent, and now we are on 30 percent this year. The avocado is a tropical tree. Its water consumption is disproportionately high for a region already at risk of desertification like the Algarve. Plus, the trees are planted in monocultures, so the high water consumption is accompanied by the use of pesticides. Claudia Seal is here to find out more on the ground. Cork oaks and pine trees typical for the region had to be cleared for this plantation, which belongs to the Frutinev's company. At the same time, public roads and paths were privatised practically overnight. You can see how they seal off their property and try to protect their plants. It looks like some high-security prison. The company has installed a drip irrigation system. On frosty winter nights, the trees have to be additionally watered with sprinklers. Today, the local activists talk to Joachim, a smallholder based right next to the plantation, and deeply worried about developments. I grow some watermelon, melon and some other stuff here using a, a, a fuel, uh, a petrol pump. Um, but then I, 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 did, I decided to stop this year because the level, as you can see, the level of the water, you could see the marks like it used to be. They spend a lot of water. This is not very deep. My borehole is not very deep. And so if they sucking the water to that area, it will disappear from some, some areas. The next generations, what, what kind of planet they gonna get with these greedy people? They all very self, 
fish person, they all, all they can think it's about money, profit, uh, lifestyle. They don't bother. They say it's to feed people. Well, I know that I can live without avocados, but I can't live without water. You see the soil here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Claudia Seal takes a soil sample from the perimeter of the plantation. Back at the lab of her university, the bioengineer will later conduct tests for contamination from industrial farming. These plants here haven't withered because of the sun. Winter has only just ended. So that can't be the reason. It's obvious. They use weed killers like glyphosate and other herbicides. Suddenly the team's work is interrupted. A local resident wants to know what they're doing on what she reminds them is a private road. She seems more bothered by the environmental activists than the plantation itself. It's good that the Algarve is now becoming a farming region, with new jobs being created. You can see that the locals aren't really aware of the issues involved. There's this one-sided perspective and no acknowledgement of any water problem. They don't care about herbicides and pesticides being applied. There's no knowledge in terms of the consequences that could affect everyone living near these plantations. Meanwhile, the avocado growers in turn accuse their opponents of having a one-sided view. Among them is Hugo Melita from Tavira. He works for the Global Avocados Company and is currently overseeing the spring harvest. The plantations supply two harvests a year. The majority of the workers here are from Bangladesh and Nepal. What we are doing at the moment is that we are selecting and taking out the fruit that we are considered that is industry fruit. Uh, so like, like the cosmetics, if you want to make uh, avocado oil versus what it is, a good quality fruit. The majority of this harvest is destined for Northern Europe, where demand has increased fivefold over the last decade. In Hugo Melita's view, meeting demand by growing the fruit relatively locally is just common sense. If we go to the avocados that are exported from the South America, that have to travel for 28 days, 30 days uh, crossing the Atlantic, uh, our, the carbon footprint on that is a lot bigger than what we are doing here. So shouldn't we produce here? Hugo insists that his avocados are environmentally friendly, which is why we're allowed to shoot here as he gives instructions to his workers. At all other plantations we approached, the response was no cameras. The new harvest, due in October, is grown with the help of a computer and satellite-controlled irrigation system. The use of pesticides is minimised, we are assured, due to the trees only needing treatment twice a year. This mulching that we have here is from the leaves that have dropped from the, from the avocado trees. And uh, if you have seen there, we don't apply herbicides and we also don't apply herbicide here. There is no herbicide in the avocados, which comparing to a lot of other, other, other crops, there are herbicides that are, that are applied. Uh, because of these drops of leaves and the mulching that is created here, we don't need to do that. And the plantation doesn't need to use groundwater either, so we're told. This area of the Algarve, we are supplied by two dams. 
uh, a com the, uh, community dams. Um, and basically the water, the water arrives to here already with pressure, uh, so we don't use wells. Um, our wells are, are stopped. Uh, we, what we are using is basically water from the rain. What we have is a lack of reservatories. Uh, because, for instance, this year we had a lot of rain. Our dams are almost uh, at, at its maximum point. Uh, so we will have water for two years, at least. Meaning that there's no downside to monoculture, people on the other side of the argument want to show that the farmer might be being economical with the facts here in the west of the Algarve. Bawajem de Bravura is a reservoir inland from Lagos. This spot would normally see waters reaching 10 metres deep in spring, but the reservoir here is practically dried up. It didn't rain for years enough. So it's, it's, it lows and lows and lows. Every oh. year it's a bit lower than the year before, and yeah. it's not enough rain. Although the people say it rained this year, but or last winter or in December and November, but it's not enough. The water in this dam is mainly used by farmers. Yeah. So they are they now started to fight with each other for the rights to use this this, this water. water. Yeah. 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 They do, they are not allowing new farmers yeah. to come yeah. and, and and using this. Yeah. Claudia Seal takes a water sample for later analysis in the lab. The bioengineer expects to find traces of herbicides, pesticides and nitrates washed in from the plantations. The management and distribution of water in the Algarve is the responsibility of the State Environmental Agency. Citizens' initiatives and environmental groups say that instead of properly monitoring compliance with guidelines, the authorities actively support industrial agriculture. Pedro Coelho heads the agency's Faro office. We're aware that we're not always able to control how much water is used on the plantations. Many plantation owners have no water meters. Landowners can simply take the risk of building plantations without permission. There's a legal loophole. Something has to change. The authorities are under pressure due to revelations of repeated irregularities in their dealings with commercial companies. Recently, an avocado producer was handed a fine of 12,000 euros for the first time, a drop in the ocean compared to the profits involved in the business. Plantation owners are obliged to supply data via water meters and have to pay up if they don't. The fines amount to 20,000 euros for individuals and 75,000 euros plus for companies. And those sums are nothing to sneeze at. The official seems almost remorseful, a reflection of the agency's rethinking its position. Portugal produces some 13,000 tonnes of avocados every year, a figure that is likely to rise. Monoculture farming has been practised for decades here in the Algarve. Before avocados, it was raspberries. But industrial production requires hard physical labour in stifling temperatures, not least in greenhouses. With locals these days reluctant to do the job, the farms recruit workers from India, Bangladesh and Nepal for an average wage of three euros fifty an hour, often under dreadful conditions. For me, it's, it's not easy here. We don't understand the immigration process, we don't understand anything. And if, if they like, they do the work. If they don't like, they, <laughs> they don't have... If you have all the documents also, they don't do the work. But uh, at this young time, we, we have uh, lots of dreams, lots of, uh, of things in the mind. So we have to control ourselves, and for me, it's not easy. Plantation manager Hugo Melita insists he treats his workers fairly. As he sees things, employing cheap labour from Southeast Asia benefits everyone involved. 
I wouldn't consider that they are in the bottom of the society. Uh, they come to work, and they come to 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 give some 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 benefits to the to the companies, um, and and for for us to continue to develop. Uh, actually, if we look if we look in the matter, uh, we also we already had several several workers that uh, that went to Nepal uh, on their vacations, and they they come back again to the companies to work. Uh, so if they do come back, it's because they are happy in what uh, in what they have. But his rosy assessment could once again be glossing over certain issues. Countless workers live in container homes on site, where we are not permitted to film. Those employed by temp agencies are particularly vulnerable, with few rights and generally having to cede half their salary to their immediate employer. Instead of earning money, many fall into debt. Today, Annette, Eileen and Claudia are headed for an open-air food market in Lagos. Among the local organic enterprises and smallholders presenting their goods here are people who have immigrated from Northern Europe. Eileen and Annette run into some acquaintances from the nearby village of Barao de Zaoxiao. As neighbours, they're trying to counter the worsening droughts with alternative farming techniques. Florian is from Germany, Michael is from Belgium. Barao is a small community. Everyone knows each other and lives close by. There's a great sense of sustainability, too. Michael produces seeds. We produce organic vegetables. And here we have the mother-in-law, baking the bread. <laughs> I'm thinking of my retirement and would at some point like to stop working in farming. Instead, I want to pass on my knowledge to children and encourage them to grow things and to care for plants, the soil and nature. A lot of farmers in Barao de Saoxiao use permaculture methods, which means no chemicals and not ruining the soil in keeping with natural processes. The yields are, of course, lower and the resulting price higher than with what are now conventionally grown vegetables. Michel is planting specially selected seedlings together with local children. Vegetables that can thrive with a minimum of water in a region frequented by drought and intense heat. The plants make do with 70% less water, but need to produce close to the same yields. It's the only option these farmers have in the long term. It's a principle you can adapt to any plant, any fruit, any seed. The yield won't be high for the first year or so. But after three or four years and having gotten used to less water, even avocados will have high yields. Florian likewise has a special way of growing produce. He accompanies ground-based vegetables like potatoes and lettuce with peach, almond and apple trees. Avocado trees would also be an option. Using companion plants is the very opposite of industrial monocultures. We have a range of vegetable crops intermixed with rows of trees, so very different species growing alongside each other. And that, in turn, is a disadvantage for pests, because they don't find many plants of the same species. So you don't need two different irrigation systems, and the soil is saturated. Florian says this setup will be the only way of farming sustainably in Portugal, although it would also spell the end of the one euro avocado.
Avocados are bound to become more expensive if they're not grown in these large monocultures. If you have more manual labor and lower quantities, then the price will definitely go up. The Regenerata initiative has another meeting today. The group has since been joined by Matthew Ambrose and Miro Paishao, the owners of the guest house. Bioengineer Claudia Seal has completed her analysis of the soil and water samples from the area around the Frutineb's plantations. The results are eagerly awaited. The pressure also we can confirm the situation. We are close to, to a highly contaminated area with glyphosate and other herbicides, so it's, it's now polluted areas. I printed some of our... So the local activists now have solid evidence. With the help of an attorney, they will now be able to take legal action against the expansion of avocado plantations in the region. Is the fruit some call green gold in fact causing ecological havoc? For some people it's a fast track to big profits. But the environmentalists are convinced that alternative approaches are possible. A lot of Portuguese people remain reluctant to join the protest. They're wary of the inevitable confrontations with the authorities. They're fed up with the red tape and see protests against the institutions as a losing battle. But these are issues of concern to Portuguese people. They'd probably imagine a quieter form of protest. The main problem is the excessive bureaucracy in this country. It's a huge hindrance, and it prevents potential new developments. Matt and Miro are no longer alone in the fight against the plantation bordering their property. Regenerata has filed a legal challenge to the construction project and its license is currently being reviewed. If granted illegally, the plantation would have to be shut down. But the holiday home hosts still fear they'll have to have their water delivered by truck in future. Will their garden dry out and become an eyesore for their guests? In their case, it's their dream and livelihood at stake. We have to work forwards to try and control it and to try to get the government to understand that these monocultures are not the way forward with agriculture. And ethically, these greedy corporations, you know, we've got to stop them or, you know, they've got to slow down. This is about the environment at the end of the day and climate change. And food for thought for those seeking a really sustainable diet. <laughs>